Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Hey, I, some days I get up and I just have this feeling, you know, there is enough suffering in the world. I don't want to increase it today. You know, maybe I won't do a lot to decrease it, but at least let me walk through this day, Lord, without increasing the amount of suffering that's going on in the world. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Ernie Sibley, a local businessman and instructor at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic and Mr. Sibley will be discussing human suffering and the power of Satan. Now, here's Father Basic. Ernie, I'm glad that you took time out from a busy schedule to come and be with me on this program and to talk. I, I'm glad that you uh, feel free uh, to do that and are at ease with it. But I wonder why you had to bring your daughter along here. to be. To, is she here for moral support or is she monitoring or, or what? Two lay people equal one clergy, I think the idea is. <laughs> that goes good. back to my upbringing as a youth. <laughs> My you need church school upbringing. You need help in dealing with the clergy. Is that it? <laughs> a are you going to, theologian. Are you going to let your daughter talk, or is she going to just uh, observe? I know she has a pad and paper here that she's going to. Uh, she's taking notes so to make sure that we don't get out of line. I think. Right. <laughs> Ernie, uh, despite the levity, I want to deal with a heavy question and topic, and that is the whole idea of human suffering. And uh, I'm thinking of um, concrete examples I usually do. You know, I learn more from the people I deal with, I guess, than out of all the books I read. But uh, there are people today who are sort of convinced that uh, most of the problems in the world are due to Satan. You know, I've had uh, individuals in my office telling me that their friends were in trouble and uh, they were convinced that they were possessed by the devil. Uh, they have this image of the devil as roaming around and uh, sort of uh, taking over everything. I have the um, impression that they, they sometimes think that human freedom is, is uh, out, that it doesn't uh, count for much. I, they, I think that maybe they saw the movie The Exorcist and were greatly taken by it, by the power of the devil. And I think part of it comes out of the, the, the whole evangelical revival and some of the fundamentalist movement that seems to want to make a great thing out of uh, the devil and Satan figure. It, the, all of this is, of course, uh, very uh, biblical and scriptural, which uh, talks about the devil. In some of our prayers, we talk about the devil going as a roaring lion about the world, ready to snatch up people. And so that's in traditional prayers as, as well as in our scriptures. But my problem with it becomes when, the, when Satan becomes almost a rival to God. That uh, Satan becomes like another principle of, of evil in the world, almost equal to God. Like you get the impression that there's a great battle going on. It's not quite uh, clear who's going to win uh, as we're going along. And I believe that this sets up uh, a lot of difficulties as we try to probe this whole uh, problem of human suffering. Very often what it ends up doing is saying, well, the devil is behind it. No, the devil has caused it all. It's sort of an easy scapegoat. Ernie, do you want to uh, do something with all of that intro, pick up any uh, side of it? Um, well, I think of my own upbringing, Jim, and uh, how much easier it was as a youngster. I could see the devil. The devil was accessible. I could also blame the devil in terms of the devil made me do it. Uh, I, I was aware of a God figure, but the God figure was not readily accessible in terms of visible to me, the traumatic things, the painful things, the punishment I received was because of the devil in me. So the more trauma, the more recognition uh, that there had to be something going on there that I couldn't identify with God, and it was much easier to identify with some sort of satanic figure. So it's more concrete, and yes. therefore, as you're going along, it's easier to, to picture how that figure could bring evil into the world. And also uh, did make it somewhat easier for me to absolve myself of responsibility, even as a youngster, in terms of the devil made me do it, literally. Yeah. Remember when Flip Wilson made that line so popular, the, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. It becomes a sort of easy scapegoat. I used that word scapegoat before, and when I said it, it, it struck some bells with me. I don't know. I think we end up doing that a lot. A lot of the psychological literature these days talks about the business of needing a scapegoat, in a sense, to absolve ourselves. 
I think of it in, in societal terms, the way we so often say that one, uh, the dominant group in society needs an inferior group, a lower group to, uh, to blame for things that go wrong. I'm afraid one could see that used against the Jewish people uh, in Nazi Germany and uh, throughout history. I mean, we see that done to the black people and other minorities in the United States. Did that with the with the Indians? The Indians, remember, were called the, the savages. It's interesting, isn't it? We call the call the Indians the savages. You ever see that movie uh, Little Big Man? I think it was where uh, the language is all reversed, and you're listening in on an Indian conversation, and they're talking about the white people as the savages, those uncivilized savages. Dustin people. Hoffman. That's yes. That's right. Remember the movie? Yes. And it's a powerful line, powerful scene to hear it the other way. Uh, but I, I, I think that this idea of scapegoat might be worth pursuing here. There's a current book which I think you've read called People of the Lie by a psychoanalyst named Scott Peck. Yeah, they know him from a, another book. What is that? The, the um, Road Less Traveled, yes, uh -huh. which has been very popular. Mm -hmm. But in People of the Lie, Peck uh, attempts to understand evil and how it exists, manifests itself in people, tries to understand from the, a scientific perspective in terms of particular behaviors, when is a person evil, the difference between evil and sin. But regarding scapegoating, Peck suggests that scapegoating is a primary manifestation of evil, at least in his model, that the habit of scapegoating is essentially evil. Yeah, that's a, that was a disturbing book to me in, in many ways. I don't know how much we want to get into that. I, I guess I want to stay with just one aspect of it now. But I, I know he uses many examples in the books, in, in the book, and talks about uh, parents who, who did that and raising youngsters. And when something went wrong, they, they would always blame other sources and never could seem to see their own responsibility in uh, the upbringing of that child. It was a disturbing book, I, I think, particularly in the aspect, in the preface he suggested that uh, be careful about identifying with the material in here in terms of your own behavior, because you might perhaps, if you read it superficially, come out thinking you are evil. And if you read it more closely, you will find out that, based on his model, you probably aren't. As a matter of fact, people who read the book almost by definition are not evil, because they tend to be self-analytical and interested in the topic. But what he talks about in the book are people that he's actually met and dealt with, where he came to the realization that these were evil people. I mean, he, they are motivated by the lowest kinds of uh, causes, reasons, and so on. Uh, they uh, are people who seem to have no feeling or care, but they, may, they are often seen as respectable com people in the community. A lot of the people he talked about were well-to-do, um, maybe even prominent in the community, but in some aspect of their lives just uh, dealt with others in a totally demonic or inhuman kind of way. Yes, he did mention that he had spent a fair amount of time in prison working with criminals, and none of the hardened criminals he knew were actually evil by in the way he defined evil. That people he defined as evil quite often were churchgoers, for instance, in terms of they would use protective coloration and appear to be perfectly respectable, would never be caught in a, a crime such as we know it, that it was much more subversive, their evil was expressed in a much more subversive manner. He differentiated between evil and good in terms of good being spirit lifting and evil being spirit defeating. So behavior which was good, uplifting for the human spirit was good behavior. Behavior which was defeating to the human spirit was evil behavior. He took it, of course, further than that, but that was an interesting Mm -hmm. He felt that the world of psychiatry and psycho psychology generally needed to study this phenomenon more, didn't he? He thinks yes. that that's an actual disease and uh, uh, a syndrome that needs to, to be looked at. And he, I noticed the way he talked about when he was in the presence of these people, he would feel very uh, uncomfortable, as though he was in the presence of the demonic in some way. Uh, yes, I, I analogized it. I, I spent seven or eight years working a crisis phone for rescue uh, here, a local telephone 
uh, crisis center and was often aware that the caller did what they did much better than I did what I did in terms of they were much more skilled at their patterns and their games than I was skilled at helping them change those patterns and games. And I, I thought that was what Peck was talking about in terms of his discomfort with some of these people. They did what they did very skillfully, and I'm not sure a traditional education for a psychoanalyst enables him or her to do it more skillfully than the patient. Mm -hmm. Even to discover what was going on. In mm -hmm. fact, he, he does talk about the when he first got onto this, I think, about the way he encountered people and tried to deal with them over a long period of time and could get nowhere with them, didn't figure out what was going on and took, didn't, wasn't firm enough with them at all and uh, didn't challenge the evil that he ended up seeing there. I guess we're trying to relate this, Ernie, to the, you know, the causes of suffering. I mean, ultimately, we're always trying to figure out how we deal with suffering, how we cope with it in one way or another, and, and uh, how we understand it. And what uh, I'm getting at is that some people want to shirk the responsibility of dealing with suffering. They want to put it on to something else, some other figure or person. Satan is very often the uh, figure that they do that with. Satan becomes the antichrist, the rival to uh, God and so on and then we got into the scapegoating because I think we do it not just with devil figures but perhaps other people or groups of people and that's where you get your stereotyping and uh, and m much of the, the terrible things that have happened in history have seemed uh, they've resulted from this kind of thing very often religious wars there was a guy on Nightline not long ago no it wasn't it was on the late night uh, public television program talking about how religion was related to wars and I think very often that's what happens is, is these other people have to be seen as the devil figures. He was analyzing Khomeini in the war against Iraq, even though Iraq made the initial aggression. In responding, Khomeini makes it a religious war. In other words, the Iraqis are an, a heretical group within the Muslim faith. And as such, they have to be attacked. And uh, Khomeini sees himself as mediating God's presence in the world. And therefore, he can call upon these 10, 12-year-old kids to go out here and get slaughtered in this war, assuring them that they will get to heaven. But you can only set up that kind of situation, it seems to me, if you see the other side as demonic somehow. A nuanced kind of thinker would have trouble doing that. You have to see the world in terms of light and dark and uh, black and white to be able to do that. Of course, I think that's what happened in the Crusades. You know, we always think the Crusades are a bad portion of Christian history. I mean, uh, terrible things done in the name of God and to fight the infidels. So uh, we just, uh, it, it's not a good thing to do <laughs> at a societal level. It's, um, it ends up hurting whole groups of people, nations, causing wars and persecutions and crusades and Agree, so on. though it does tend to be, I think, a natural dynamic of all groups. Uh, any person likes to define themselves as a member of the in-group. One of the criteria of the in-group is suggesting how much better they are than the out-group. Uh, and by definition, that can become scapegoating. Uh, I think perhaps excessive nationalism, for instance. Uh, Peck might, uh, in his book, call it potentially evil in terms of that would be scapegoating and saying, my country, right or wrong, by definition, we are better than those who are not born and raised in the United States of America. So. Uh, there is a lot of potential for the creation of evil and the creation of suffering in that sort of behavior. Yeah, that's the crucial point that you just brought that the creation of suffering. I often talk about it under the increasing the pool of suffering in the world. You know, I, I, some days I get up and I just have this feeling, you know, there is enough suffering in the world. I don't want to increase it today. You know, maybe I won't do a lot to decrease it, but at least let me walk through this day, Lord, without increasing the amount of suffering that's going on in the world. You know, I, I, don't you, I mean, there's a, I, that, that phrase, that idea that there's this pool of suffering, there's this whole bit that goes on, there's the cross being carried by so many people, and it seemed like it'd be a worthwhile thing in, to do in life just to lighten the cross a little bit. I always go back to Elie Wiesel saying that, you know, suffering is good for nothing. Elie Wiesel is the Jewish novelist who uh, went through the concentration camps as a young person and so on, and knows suffering in a way that few people do. And um, Elie Wiesel says suffering is good for nothing except to learn not to inflict it on others. 
Uh, and, and as we're talking here, you know, I, I began the program on sort of a light note, but when you're talking suffering, I mean, you, sometimes you just, you, you shouldn't be glib. You know, I mean, suffering is when someone's standing there in pain, uh, is anxious and so on, or someone is suffering and laying in bed physically hurting. I mean, you, you, you need comfort at that time, you know, and they don't need to be told, I don't think, that you're there because you're sinful or you're there because you're a bad person or at a societal level, we don't need to be pointing at people in the ghetto who are poor and unemployed and so on and say, they're there because they're lazy, because they uh, have vices and so on. We really need uh, to get beyond that. And that, that's still a common thing for people to think that this suffering is inflicted because of some personal sin. And that's, of course, the easy way out, I think, for all of us. Uh, it's much easier for me to disengage by saying that somehow evil and suffering in you are your fault. You must have created it. You must have earned it. That way I can absolve myself of any responsibility and walk past you and perhaps throw a few polite words at you but not engage with the suffering you're going through. Right. It becomes very impersonal in a way and uh, failure to engage in or really encounter, as you said. Yes, so many days I get out of bed thinking the same thing and also thinking, yeah, I don't need to touch anybody suffering today. I'm not sure I can handle yeah, it. Yeah, I feel too fragile myself yes. today to, to really mm -hmm. uh, get into that. And, we, and, and there's truth in that, isn't there? I mean, some days uh, we simply need to hold ourselves together to make it through the day. Sometimes it's a victory just to have dealt with whatever suffering is there uh, uh, in a given day. And uh, maybe you go to bed at night then saying, thank you, Lord for helping me to get to this point, yes. for being with me as I traveled the path. Mm -hmm. Ernie, I'm thinking of uh, the scriptures in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 3. And Jesus uh, encounters um, a man born blind, as I'm recalling the story. And his apostles, steeped as they are in the culture and carrying the presuppositions of their own training, say to him, why is he born blind? Did he sin? Is it because of his sin or his parents? And in saying that, they were reflecting the times, as I suggested. It was simply assumed that there was a connection between one's personal sins and the amount of suffering that one had in one's life. And I think at that point, Jesus uh, said something that uh, is really crucial to a full understanding of the gospel, because his response is, neither one. He doesn't accept either side of the traditional dispute that was going on within Judaism about why people suffered. And he is saying, neither one, this is happening somehow for the glory of God. It's somehow this is to manifest the strange and mysterious ways of God in our world. And I think what is crucial about that is that Jesus cut forever for us, to follow his followers, this one-to-one -one relationship between sin and suffering. What he's telling us, in effect, is that we can never look at another person who has just gotten cancer or whose children are ill or uh, whose marriage broke breaks up or who are grieving over death or something and look, say, aha, they deserve that, they sinned. You know, or we can't look at groups of people and say they are bad people, therefore we should make war on them. Can't look at the Soviets and say those are people are all devils somehow. We ought to uh, be ready to blow them off the face of the earth. You simply, seems to me, cannot maintain that as a blanket position. It, it is just uh, it, undercut by this message of Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't go on to explain it to us anymore. It leaves us in great mystery, but he cuts the causal connection between personal sin and individual suffering. There's an interesting other side to that coin. Uh, there's been a lot of articles recently over the last five or ten years regarding cancer patients and those who survive the cancer to live out a full life and often they manage to do that by some sort of positive thinking or prayer or some sort of mystical event and the suggestion is to the people who aren't going to recover that they somehow fell short in that that if they had thought positively or had had enough faith or whatever they also would have been healed and the articles nowadays are trying to help people get out from that responsibility for their own illness uh, certainly there are 
spontaneous cures for cancer or other illnesses, but I, it's not based on some sort of, uh, I don't want to say miracle, that would be, not be a fortunate choice. It's not based on the willpower of the individual. Uh, it's not individually created. So you don't kill yourself, you don't cure yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you bring up an interesting counterpoint that really ought to be addressed, I think, uh, in uh, careful fashion. I, the, I, I want to stick by the original statement, I think, that you know, we cannot assume a causal relationship between sin and suffering. We can't look at other people and say they're culpable or blameworthy. But on the other hand, there are things to be said. Obviously, sometimes poor behavior does result in suffering. So someone who drinks too much the night before has a hangover the next day. It's a pretty clear causal relationship. Mm -hmm. Don't need to posit any magic for that. You know, some people who uh, smoke too much, Ernie, I wish you'd put that cigarette out <laughs> right now, but uh, you're undercutting my example. But some, I mean, people who smoke too much might end up hurting their health. And down the road, you could say there is a causal connection there. You what you cannot say is that you are sinning now in, in uh, smoking that cigarette. And God will get me. Yeah. You cannot impute um, blameworthy behavior. You can't impute culpability to someone else like that. But, I mean, it seems obvious to me that some of our behavior uh, affects what goes on. In, uh, in Hinduism, we have the interesting notion of karma. Right? Karma says something like that to all of our actions there are uh, effects that we don't escape from the consequences of our actions. We are product of those uh, decisions and behaviors and activities that we have uh, performed in life. There's a sort of direct relationship. The Hindus talk a lot about karma. A friend of mine was over in, in India traveling around and said that's a common thing for, for the ordinary person to talk about, your karma. Um, well, that doctrine that there are clear effects, I mean, have some sort of empirical basis, it seems to me. People who exercise a lot might well have greater energy. People who eat too much get too heavy. And but so perhaps people that uh, have a higher level of energy tend to exercise. It's rather hard to tell which is the cause and which is the effect. It is. Generally, I'm concerned about the possible shakiness of any cause-effect relationship. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to measure scientifically and to prove which came first, uh, the energy or whatever, or the exercise. Uh, but I think we're willing to admit there's some connection. You got a headache the next day after you drank too much. I mean, but there are also clear. people who drink too much who do not have a headache the sure. next day. Yeah. And that might disprove the rule. Well, I think that if you look at an individual case, though, you're not going to deny there's a causal effect in, a, in an individual case. Agree, but of course we do have certain theologians in history who have encouraged us to look at a larger picture yeah. and not try to isolate one person's behavior out of a whole system, but to try to pull back and look at the whole environmental system. For instance, yeah. with alcoholics, it's much too yeah. easy to say that he has become an alcoholic because of such yeah. and such so-and-so, and now that he's an alcoholic, such sure. and such so-and-so will happen. Right. In other words, you want a more organic, systemic, uh, uh, coherent approach to this. I just heard the other day on public radio, they said a study said something like the offspring of alcoholics were four times more likely to become alcoholic. I mean, a rather striking statistic, in which uh, I think helps to support your point of seeing things in a larger organic framework. But, um, two, I think we, we need to go back to um, our general th question of how this suffering ends up in the world. Our doctrine of original sin ends up relating to that. Uh, we talk about original sin as uh, being... Um, somehow making a permanent difference in the world. Uh, however you conceive of the first sin of human beings, Christians generally have thought that uh, uh, the fact that uh, humans rebel against God brings disorder into the world. That somehow the, the situation that we have is influenced by the sins of human beings helping to create this pool of suffering that goes on in the world. Not one to one again. And again, it seems to me this is rather obvious. I mean, if people are greedy, a whole bunch of people are greedy, 
then what happens is is that they go to war to take over territory and you have suffering or people in the business world are uh, selfish and insensitive and they step on other people to get to where they want to get to uh, the other people are hurt and out of work or anxious or frustrated or something and so it does seem to me that there is this fact that that human sin and what we call it's generally called Christian circles the original sin the rebellion of human beings against God at the very beginning has rather permanently and universally affected the world in an adverse fashion so we, we don't want to get away from that side of it either and again it seems to me that's rather empirical when nations uh, let nationalism take over they make war and you end up with terrible suffering and so on yeah you tend to to go along with that contextual thing as well or yeah yeah, yeah. I, I have no problem with that yeah okay um but the I guess the dominant point that we wanted to insist on, Ernie, uh, throughout all of this is that there is not a clear causal relationship between personal sin and evil, and that um, what we've got is a situation where we don't want to end up scapegoating. Whatever uh, it is, whether it's putting it off, the devil made me do it, or this inferior group of people is the cause of all the trouble, or my spouse who doesn't understand me, or my friends who are out of line. We can't end up doing that. I think the point you made earlier on really needs to be buttressed and that is that we are responsible for ourselves that evil is a part of life we all end up carrying the cross and what we have to do is take responsibility for that